guys here madly back there trying to adjust the levels. Daniel chapter 6. We'll start off in verse 17. I believe we got through uh, 16, didn't we, last week? We left Daniel in a very precarious place. He's in a den or a pit, if you will. Uh, the, the word there in the Aramaic for den is the word gov, which literally means pit. Now, a little tricky thing here that we have to keep in mind. In this part of uh, Babylonian Empire, which formerly was, it's very, very, the water table is very high in between the Tigris and the Euphrates River. So the pits were dug partway down, but then they had walls coming up as well. So this lion's den, if you will, this lion's pit, was partially underground and partially above ground. And remember I said last week that the walls were probably at least 18 feet, 15 to 18 feet. So when they cast Daniel in the lion's den, he most likely was pretty beat up when he hit the bottom. But what happened? Someone can tell me what happened. I wasn't that quiet last week. When, before that, before that, why was it Daniel smashed the smithereens when they threw him into this 18-foot hole? An angel caught him. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Verse 17. Let's start this off. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of his lords, that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. You know, that sounds real, real similar to something else, doesn't it? Wasn't there another stone enclosure where a stone was rolled across the opening? Sure was. Matthew 27, verses 65 and 66, the Jews are talking to Pilate, and they're afraid that Jesus' disciples are going to come and take his body out of the tomb and say that he was resurrected, because that's what Jesus had said. So they're worried about this. So they want a guard posted over the tomb. So in Matthew 27, 65 and 66, Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go your way. Make it as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone and setting the guard. A couple of reasons that this stone was sealed is they don't want the lions getting out. They don't want Daniel escaping. But there's another reason. They didn't want people getting in there and working Daniel over before the lions had a chance. He needs to be punished according to their laws. That means he gets beat up by the lions. Verse 18, now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him. Also, sleep went from him. So there's little doubt, little doubt that Daniel got better sleep that night than Darius. Darius is upset. He's upset. He doesn't want this to happen. He's been tricked by some of the other, oh, what do you want to call them? I'm not going to call them holy men because they were anything but that. But some of the other people in the administration, they were jealous of Daniel. Now, Daniel, we know he's prayed when he's in the den. Why do we know that? Because he prayed every day everywhere. He was constantly praying. That's why he's in the den right now, right? Because he's being punished for praying. He didn't need to start praying when he's put there. Because he already was. Look at Psalm 22, verse 21. It's a beautiful psalm. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horns of the wild ox. You have answered me. Now, you know it's even possible that while he was in the lion's den, Daniel prayed that very psalm? Possible. They used to play, uh, pray the psalms quite often. Now, there are more uh, incidences of lions and miracles in the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 11, what's commonly called the Hall of Faith, where we hear the stories of all the great people of faith and how God delivered them. Hebrews chapter 11, if you look down to verse 32 and 33, here's what it says. 
And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets. Verse 33, and through faith, or who through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, and here it is, stopped the mouths of lions. Another, another incident could be about Daniel. I don't know. What do you think? Maybe not. What a crazy night this must have been, though, for Daniel. Can you imagine? He's thrown over. He's expecting to smash on the ground. Instead, he's caught by an angel, right? I don't know if he saw the angel. He might have. He might not have. Didn't matter. It happened. Now he's sleeping with lions and an angel. Verses 19 and 20 say this. Then the king arose very early in the morning. See, Darius is really worried about what's going on. So the king rose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve, continually, But able to deliver you from the lions? Look what he said and how he said it. It's amazing. The king arose very early in the morning, first and foremost. As I said early, I'm sure Darius was not getting good sleep. But I'm sure Daniel did. Isaiah writes, when the Spirit is poured upon us, listen to what it says. Chapter 32, verses 16 through 18. Then justice will dwell in the wilderness, and righteousness remain in the fruitful field. The work of righteousness will be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. My people will dwell in a peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. I'm sure... Daniel's probably thinking about this as he's in this pit, this lion's den. And he knows what happens when somebody's thrown in there. This was a chosen method of execution by the Persian. You can read all about it. There are a lot of good stories online. But Darius is eager to go to the lion's den. He wants to know what happened. He didn't want Daniel thrown in there in the first place. But he wants to go see what happened. He really does want Daniel to be all right. It says in a lamenting voice, right? Lamenting in Hebrew is, uh, or Aramaic, sorry, is the word atsav. It almost sounds like sav. It means to pain, to grieve. So Darius is in pain as he's yelling out to Daniel. Definitely afraid, but yet somewhat confident also. Daniel, servant of the living God, he said, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? What do you notice about that? The very first thing that Darius does, he does something interesting. He recognizes Daniel in God, who Daniel is in his position in the Lord. This is a great application for us, for ourselves. Think about it. Declare who we are in our king. I'm not talking about some silly New Age practice where you speak a bunch of affirmations every day. That doesn't work. I've tried it. It doesn't work. But if you look at what God says about us, hmm. Sally, I think it was in the, our prayer time earlier this morning, you used one of the scriptures I was going to use for what we need to declare about ourselves. But first of all, let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 37. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Doesn't that thrill you? We should say that every day. Talk to yourself. Everybody thinks you're nuts already anyway. So just (laughs) talk to yourself and say, I'm more 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 than a conqueror through him who loved me. That's Jesus. You're more than a conqueror in him. So am I. 
Do I look a little weird today? Other than, you know, other days? You're saying, well, no, it's always that. <laughs> and there's a reason I asked that question. I, I forgot to do something very important this morning. My wife's very upset with me. I forgot to take. I won't tell you. <laughs> Got to set you up a little bit first. Look at what verse 38 of Romans 8 says, and this is where Sally comes in. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Nothing can separate us from that. Should we say that each day? Absolutely. Now, I'm not trying to start some sort of Pharisaic cult where we repeat things every day. You know, no, no, we don't want that. But there are wonderful things in the word of God that you can say to yourself each day because God said it to you already. That is awesome. How about Philippians 4.13? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's his strength, brothers and sisters. It's not yours. It's his. We can do all things through his strength. Now, when we say all things, that, that you know, we need to understand this means within the will of God. You're not going to go out and enter some powerlifting meet and win because you read this. Not what it means. Okay? But it's not your own power. We have little power, if any. We're just feeble little things. Feeble little things. Where does that power come from? The Lord God Most High. Remember the minor prophet Zechariah? Chapter 4. Verse 6. The second part of verse 6. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. That's who we have to call on. The power that spoke everything into existence, we can call on that same power. Isn't that something? Doesn't that just bless you? Daniel couldn't have served God any more stringently than he has been doing. He's thrown in this pit because of his constant worship toward the Lord. In a time when it was said, don't do it or you're going to be killed. But Daniel wouldn't have survived if God hadn't sent an angel or saved him through his own power. Daniel's seen deliverance before. He saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego survive a fiery furnace, didn't he? And he heard the stories, if he wasn't there firsthand, which I don't believe he was, he heard the stories that there was an extra person walking around in the fiery furnace with them. Yeah. God protects us or removes us to his glory. Jude chapter 24 and 25. I, I, did I say chapter? Jude verse 24 and 25. I was thinking, oh, it only has one chapter, son. Um, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless. That's our God. He's able to do all these things. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Our God is able. The question here was, is your God able? Yes, our God is able. Uh, you know, Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25 says uh, an interesting thing. Therefore, he, being God, is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, this is Jesus, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus is interceding for all of us right now. Who would you rather have pray for you? Me or Jesus? <laughs> please don't say me because <laughs> I know nobody's thinking that, but just please don't say it because I might get struck dead or something. Darius must have been overjoyed hearing Daniel's voice. The lions had not harmed the servant of our Heavenly Father. 
the heavenly king. Now, what's he say? What's, what's, what's Daniel's response? Oh, king, live forever? Sounds kind of silly, right? But that was the proper response or the proper greeting to the king. Verse 21, Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. In 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 31, we see this as well, and it kind of highlights for us how this was the proper greeting for the king. This is talking about Bathsheba, the wife of King David. 1 Kings 1, 3, 1. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth, and she paid homage to the king and said, Let my lord King David live forever. This is her husband. She doesn't need to stand on formality with him, right? But that's how we greeted the king. Now, verse 22, my God sent his angel. Daniel's telling Darius, my God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. What a thrill this must have been for Daniel. When you read the Bible, do you ever try and put yourself in some of those situations? Or are you all a lot smarter than me? Every once in a while, I try and put, put myself in some of those situations, and I, I'm terrified at how I would have reacted had I been with Jesus. If Jesus would have come in this day and age, I'm afraid, well, first of all, I don't believe we would have given him three and a half years to minister. Sadly, I think we would have crucified him really quickly but I try and put myself in these situations. We're not told how the angel shut the mouths of the lions. First of all, God didn't need the angel there to shut the mouths of the lions. God could have just said, lions, shut your mouth. And they couldn't do anything. But he sent an angel, and I'm convinced he did that for Daniel, so Daniel could see something there. Of course, I just told you that we don't know if he saw the angel or not, so that sort of makes my little point moot. But think of it. What if he just grabbed hold of a lion's mouth? Wouldn't that have been awesome? Wouldn't you have loved to have seen that? I picture crazy stuff in my head. But, you know, this lion thrashing around and making all kinds of racket. The angel holding on. See, that's pretty funny if you picture that. Lions are powerful and majestic. Proverbs chapter 30, verse 29, I believe it is. I've... Left it, not written down here, but that's what I think it is. There are three things which are majestic in pace. Yes, four, which are stately in walk. A lion, this is verse 30, which is mighty among beasts and does not turn away from any. That's who's in this pit with Daniel. Thanks be to God, there's an angel there too. Daniel says, or think about what he's declaring now. I was found innocent before him, and also, O king, I've done no wrong before you. This, this man is totally innocent. He's not done anything wrong. Yes, he broke the edict that Darius had been tricked into signing. But whose law do we obey first? God's always, always God's. We're supposed to obey those that are set over us. We are. We're supposed to. I read those scriptures last week. But not if they contradict the law of God. Never. Daniel was going to pray to his God, no matter what edict was out there. Jesus was innocent as well. In Mark chapter 14, uh, verse 56, you see that the Jews were trying to convince Pilate that he should be executed, that he should be destroyed, as one translation reads. In this verse, Mark 14, 56, many bore false witness against Jesus, but their testimonies did not agree. The Jews brought all kinds of people in, the leaders, trying to get them to say, yeah, Jesus said this or Jesus did that, but their testimonies didn't agree. Pilate was able to look the other way. Remember, Pilate wanted to let Jesus go. This man's innocent. Amazing. We want to make sure that like Daniel, we are innocent 
in what we do. Are we going to sin and make mistakes? You better believe it. I bet I've sinned more this morning so far than most of you have this week. I'm, I'm just a bozo. I don't know. But the thing is this. We have sins that work vertically toward God, and then we have sins that work horizontally towards other people. What did Jesus say was the greatest commandment when he was asked? Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, right? It's called the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And then what's he say? We're to love him essentially with everything we are. Different translations render it different ways. With all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. Some say with all your mind. We're to love God with everything that we are. Everything that we have. Okay, that's vertical. That's to God. But the second commandment, Jesus said, the second great commandment, is from Leviticus chapter 19, the second part of verse 18. And that's love your neighbor as yourself. If we do those two things, I believe I said this last week as well, if we do those two things, Jesus said the law and the prophets hang on those two commandments. We won't be making vertical sin because we'll be loving God with everything that we are. We won't be making horizontal sin. We won't be sinning against our neighbors because we're loving them as we love ourselves. Praise God. That's what we need to be concentrating on. Verse 23. Now, there are a few things in verse 23 we're going to want to look at. Now, the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he had believed in his God. Well, there are a couple things to note. Number one, Darius was exceedingly glad. He's real happy. He rejoiced that Daniel had been delivered from harm. He was very pleased. He did not want to see harm come to Daniel. Uh, But you know what? He's rejoicing with Daniel now. Romans chapter 12, verse 15, and this is a real good key for us how to live our life. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That's so important, so important. How many of you, we kind of forget what words to use when we come across somebody that we love or that we're close to who's had some sort of bereavement. Maybe they've lost their parent or they've lost a brother or sister, or a dear friend, or a child. Even if you've suffered that very same loss that they have, please don't go up to them and say, I know just how you feel, because you do not. Even if you suffered a similar loss, we're all different. We all relate to each other in different ways. But you can use what Romans says here. You can rejoice with those who rejoice. And you can weep with those who weep. There's great power when you go up to somebody who is in great pain and they're sobbing and you throw your arms around them and you hug them and you tell tell them you love them and you weep with them. There's great power in that. Philippians chapter 2 verse 4 says, Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And Romans 12.10 is similar. Be kindly, affectionate to one another with brotherly love, and here's the kicker, in honor giving preference to one another. Best marital advice I could ever give. You know, people say, that it was, I maybe perform a wedding or something like that, and they want counseling. Best thing I can tell them is that scripture right there. Try to outdo each other in loving and preferring each other. That works for friendships. It works for your relationships within your family. Familial relationships familial relationships can be kind of tough sometimes. Everybody sees everybody for just who they are. They're with you in the same house at your high point and your low point. Oh, man. That's bringing back memories. Second point I want to look at here is Daniel was taken up out of the den. What's that remind you of? 
Come on, all shout out the same word. Pastor. There you go. I love this guy. Doesn't it sound like that to you? They're in, uh, Daniel's in this horrible place. There are lions everywhere. He's being protected, yes, but then he's removed up and out. I love that. Psalm 91, 11 and 12, I quoted it last week. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In your hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, Satan tried to use that against Jesus when he decided to take Jesus up to the pinnacle of the temple. If you're the son of God, throw yourself down. God's word says he's going to give angels there. They're going to bear you up. Jesus wasn't fooled, was he? Don't tempt the Lord your God. What are angels? A great definition is Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits? Who are they sent to? Sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation. That's us. That's what angels are for. They're to minister to us. Praise God. I bet we would be shocked at how many times an angel may have ministered to us in our life. Another good application for us right here. I said this last week. We're surrounded, maybe not by physical lions, but we're surrounded by lions anyway. Who's the chief of the lions? 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 tells us, be sober, be vigilant, because who? Our adversary, the devil. Mm. He walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom? He may devour. He's after us. He doesn't like you. You have Jesus' blood covering you. He doesn't like you. You are a threat to him. So he tries to find ways to trip us up. We're looking forward to being taken up and out, like Bill said, the rapture. 1 Thessalonians 4.17, right? Then we who are alive remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air, up and out, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Amen, amen. But he says all this happened because Daniel believed in his God. Psalm 118, verse 8, I love this. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. <laughs> amen? We put our trust in God. I love Jeff, my brother. I love him a lot. We hang out together, but I trust Jesus a lot more than you, my friend. Even though, even though you're, a, even though you're a great guy. Mark chapter nine, verse twenty-three. Jesus said, "Now, let's rephrase this for a moment. Remember this story. There's a man who has a child, a son, and he's been harassed by demons, and the demons throw him down. He foams at the mouth. All this stuff. People aren't able to help this guy." But in Mark 9, 23, Jesus says to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Now, look at the man's response. This is a great lesson for us, a great lesson for us. He says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He had the guts to tell God, Jesus, that he didn't have all the faith. Yes, I believe, Lord, but I need more. Help me. If we could come to that position where we're not afraid to tell the truth to the Lord, what a revolution there would be. But we play the little games. We bring up the imposter. Have I ever talked to you about the imposter before? We all have them. Mine's a fairly good-looking young man with long hair. <laughs> Definitely an imposter, right? No, when we get to church, we bring out the imposter. Maybe we've just done something really bad and we're in a really angry mood, but we're in church now, so we've got to smile and look at everybody. We bring the imposter out. Oh, bless you, brother. Bless you. Isn't this a beautiful day? Let's always tell the truth to the Lord. Always be honest with God. The Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked. And save them because they trust in him. That's Psalm 37, verse 40. We just need to be honest. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And Jesus did. 
Verse 24, and the king gave the command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions. Listen to this. Them, their children, and their wives, and the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Wow. Now, I'm convinced if the lions had already gotten Daniel, I believe that Darius would still have thrown those people in. He was mad at them for what they had done. Their children and their wives, too. I I can just, you know, like I said, my mind goes weird places. Can you imagine the wife as they're being dragged down to the pit? I told you not to do that. See, you know. I don't know if I should look over in that direction or not. them, their children, and their wives. There is a principle in spiritual warfare. God will oftentimes cause our enemy to be impaled on the very same snare that he set for us. Psalm chapter 7, verses 14 through 16. Behold, the wicked brings forth iniquity. Yes, he conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood. He made a pit and dug it out and then has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head, and his violent dealing shall come down on his own crown. We've seen that often, haven't we? Now, there's a great book in the Bible that I hope all of you have read, the book of Esther. How many of you love Esther, the book of Esther? How many of you find it one of the funniest things you've ever read? There are parts to Esther that are better than any TV show, any movie. God is funny. Read Esther. But the part I'm getting at, there's a man named Haman, or some say Haman, but for fun, I'm going to keep calling him Haman. He hates the Jews. He wants to kill Mordecai the Jew. He hates them. Anti-Semitism at its best. So he tries to do different things to get Mordecai the Jew in trouble. But then he decides he's going to build a gallows to hang Mordecai on. He builds this massive gallows. I don't remember how tall it is. 50 feet? 75 feet? Ridiculously high. He builds it. But then, interestingly enough, listen to Esther chapter 7, verse 10. The king finds out what's going on. So he has Haman hung upon his own gallows. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. This is another application for us, brothers and sisters. I'm going to ask you a question, a serious question. How many times through our own sin, not the sin of anyone else, but through our own sin, have we let lions into our lives? Have we let things into our lives that destroyed our family, harmed our children, broke our relationship with our spouse? Happens all the time. Especially look at parents and what sins they might bring into the home that gravely damage their kids. There are so many sins. I just jotted down a few but I'm sure the Holy Spirit's revealing to you others. Inadvertently introducing our children, our precious little children, to pornography because we brought some into the home or we have some on our computer. And when we're out of the house and our kids are there alone and they get on our computer and see that vile filth. And I'm telling you, it affects them. I don't mean to be silly, but this, this isn't a silly story. I probably shouldn't even say it, but it's germane. I can still remember as a young kid the first time I ever saw a pornographic picture. I heard that. I heard Playboy uttered. I had an older cousin that had a bunch in his room, and he had surfer magazines, and I was in love with the ocean. I grabbed a surfer, put the Playboy in the surfer. First time, it's still in my stupid head. 
We've got to be careful. We don't want to harm those we love. What about an affair? What about about a, a couple? And one of them has an affair, and it tears the family in two. We've let lions into our home. Not showing our children honesty. They see us when we're at home and we're at our lowest point and they hear their parents talking back and forth. And maybe they're trying to find a way to cheat on their income taxes. Imagine that. Would any of us do that? Remember the honesty thing I said? But the kids see all that. You're telling them to be truthful and yet you're lying to the government or anybody else. They see you where you are, and they hear what you're saying, and they judge you. You can say judge not, lest you be judged of your kid all you want, and it's not going to change what they do. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. The reason I put that in there is because the enemy has lots of tricks for us. Lots of tricks. He knows each one of us better than we know ourselves. He knows where our weaknesses are. Do you think he's not going to try and put something in front of us? No, he's not all powerful, but he has lots of help. If you have a particular weakness, I guarantee you the enemy is going to try to find some way to put that weakness in front of you, a temptation that plays to that weakness. So Paul the Apostle in the epistle to the Ephesians said, see that you walk circumspectly. Remember, with your head on a swivel, looking around, trying to ascertain what's in front of you, what dangers there are. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Are are our days evil right now? Come on. I, I, I can't believe what it's like. You know, I told Barbie, I don't know, a month or two ago, I'm sure glad my mom and dad are dead. They would not have survived what's going on in this world today. They wouldn't have believed what our country has become. They wouldn't believe how our leaders behave. They wouldn't believe any of it. The vile, foul things that are taught to our kids in school. You know, a few years ago, probably, what was it, 10 Eight or ten years ago, she has no idea what I'm asking her. We were driving from church. No, we were driving to church, and we had our little grandbaby with us, the oldest of our grandchildren. And uh, she was 12, I think, at the time, something like that. And she was all excitedly telling us about a book she'd read at school. It was in the school library, public school. Okay, And it was about this young boy about her age, and it was about his first kiss. So she's all excited. Yeah, yeah, about his first kiss. He'd never been kissed before. So as we examined it, his kiss was with another boy. That's a book in our public schools. And that's tame compared to some stuff I'm being shown right now. Is that letting a lion into our kid's life? You better bet it is. We're the, we're the whack jobs of the world, guys. Everybody thinks we're nuts. Barb and I were on an airplane a month or so ago going to Portland, and this person from Portland was talking about how awesome Portland is because you get to fly your freak flag. And I'm sitting there thinking, my freak flag's way bigger than yours. I follow Jesus. Yeah. We're the wackadoodles of the world. Everybody says it's getting better. It's good out there right now. All this stuff, this progression. I see people wearing rainbow shirts that says pride on it. And I know they're not gay. They told me they weren't. So I ask them, what are you proud about? Because my gay friends can now come out. When we start calling good, evil, and evil good, what is going on? Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. 
Woe to those who call evil good and good evil. Who put darkness for light and light for darkness? Who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter? We've got to be so careful. We have to be on guard for all the stuff that's out there to hurt our children, to hurt our grandchildren, and yes, even hurt us. Oh, no, I'm, I'm a man of God. I, I read the word every day. So what? If you're not watching out, you're going to get smacked in the head. John chapter 10, verse 10. Jesus tells us about the enemy. He says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But then what's Jesus say? I've come that they might have life and life more abundantly. Come on, guys, we get to choose. What would you rather, have life more abundantly or follow after anything that's going to cause you to be killed or, or your stuff stolen or to be destroyed? It's an easy choice. What do you want for your life? I keep thinking about Cain. He's been on my mind a lot lately. Not, not, not the little Chinese guy on TV. But Cain and Abel. That's pretty funny, guys. Cain slew his brother Abel. And his countenance fell. He was mad at God, for one thing, because God had honored his brother's sacrifice and not his. So God's talking to him, and in Genesis chapter 4, he's already asking, you know, why is your countenance fallen? But then he tells him something. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. We can only rule over sin by admitting our sin, repenting, and asking God's forgiveness. Can I use you for a second? One of the things I love about this guy, I, I love many things about Bill. He's an awesome assistant pastor, is he not? And But he always, I've noticed, when he prays, whether it's just the two of us praying or in a group, he always is cognizant of sin and asking God for his sin to be forgiven. I mean, he's... he's this is the pastor here. If he has sin, do the rest of us have sin? You better believe it. But he's smart enough to take it to the Lord. And he doesn't care who's in the room hearing him say, forgive me for my sins, Lord. That's what we need to do. Be honest before God. Hmm. James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15. Each one is tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Death. But see where the sin came from? Flip Wilson was wrong. The devil didn't make him do it. You're drawn away by your own desires. Tempted when he's drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire is conceived... Hmm, gives birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death, brings forth death. How do we stay away from that? It's easy. What's my prescription for everything? Absolutely. Absolutely. Drown yourself in God's word. Be reading his word every day. Then be praying every day, and then be in fellowship as often as you can. I had somebody say to me not too long ago, you would be happy if we were in church every day. That's right. I would. I wish we had church every day. That's how we fight against all this garbage. Stay in the Word. Stay in prayer. Stay in fellowship. The lions overpowered these people as they were thrown in before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Can you imagine that? This tells us how ravenous these lions were. But you know what? The devil is even more ravenous for your soul. But guess what? All the sin that so easily ensnares us. And I might be the biggest sinner in this church. I don't know. I'm sure I'm somewhere up there. But God's given me a way out. I don't have to let those lions run loose in my life. 1 John 1.9. If we confess our sins, like I'm saying my brother Bill always does, 
He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't have to let that stuff run amok in our lives. We take it to him, and then he removes us. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Galatians 5.16, I say then, walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Praise God. Let's just bury ourselves in him. Then none of this stuff's going to bother us. Uh, verse 25, i got to hurry up here. Then King Darius wrote, to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. Well, there's a similar pattern all through the book of Daniel, with kings writing edicts and then writing letters. Kind of funny. I'm going to skip some of this. Verse 26. Darius says, I make a decree. Now listen carefully. I make a decree in every dominion of my kingdom. Men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed, and his dominion shall endure to the end. So he's making another decree. The last one got him into a little bit of trouble. Do we realize the importance of this decree, though? Think about it. It's quite possible we wouldn't be sitting here today if Darius had not made this decree all those years ago. Why is that? Remember, I told you to read Ezra and Nehemiah. Because of what Cyrus does, and as well as Darius, the Jews are able to go back to Jerusalem and are able to rebuild the temple. So much in our world today revolves around just that. People either hate the Jews, hate Jerusalem, hate Israel, and want to level it, or like us, they have great love for those people. James chapter 2, verse 19 says an interesting thing. You believe that there is one God, you do well. But even the demons believe and tremble. So just saying, yeah, 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 I believe in God, that's not salvific. That doesn't mean anything. You have to trust Jesus for your salvation. You have to confess your sins to him and trust him. Right? You can, you, saying so doesn't make it so. I think I've given you some silly illustrations before about saying so doesn't make it so. I think I pronounced myself president of the United States or something one day. It wasn't true, was it? I might have said that I have a wonderful uh, coat of hair. Is that the proper way to say it? Coat of hair? <laughs> Depends on what kind of animal you are. <laughs> Darius says all the right things, but once again, he's calling him the God of Daniel. He's not saying, my God. Verse 27, he delivers and rescues. Still Darius talking about God. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Now, here's a quick one. Think about this. This is a little bonus extra deal I was thinking about. Daniel wasn't saved from the lion's den. He was saved through the lion's den. Think about Jesus telling his followers, yeah, let's get in the boat and go across the lake. And then there's this massive storm, and they're terrified. Oh, we're perishing, we're perishing. Did Jesus know there was going to be a storm? Of course he did. Why did he send them into that storm? Why was Daniel allowed to go into the lion's den? Jesus told us, in this life or in this world, you will have tribulation. He never promised us it was going to be easy. Has your life been easy? I've had, I've had a pretty easy life, I think. Had an idyllic childhood. But yet, there are so many things that are messed up in my life. I'm a physical wreck, as some of you are as well. Luke chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit. Led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days and nights by Satan. The Holy Spirit, one, one gospel says, drove him into the wilderness to be tempted. Think about it. 
Just because we follow after Jesus doesn't mean that everything's going to go really super well. Fact is, what's the truth? When you say yes to Jesus and you start following him, all hell is going to break out against you. Because now you matter to the devil. He didn't care about you before. Now he does. You're a threat. You're a danger. But greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Don't be fearful. Jesus said, fear not, little flock. Let's not be afraid. But let's also be smarter than to believe that just if everything goes really well, that must mean it's God's will. I've heard that so many times. Yeah, I'm trying to decide what to do. Well, if, if every, everything's going so well when I think this way, that must be God's will. I usually think the other way. Because in my experience, when I find what I want, think God wants me to do, stuff starts happening. I get smacked in the head all the time. So I act the way I do. There are a lot of similarities between Daniel and Jesus, but we're not going to go into them. Maybe next time I'm up here. What I'd like us to do is let's just take a few moments to sit where we are. I'm not going to ask you to stand. I'm not going to ask you to run up to the, well, I guess we call this an altar, platform, whatever it is. I don't call things by the right name in case you can't remember. Or just the other day I called Barb Beverly. I would like us to just sit here for a few moments, and let's let the Spirit of the Lord God Most High speak to us. We all have lions in our life, boys and girls, we all do. If you tell me you do not or you don't run into any, I'm going to not believe you, because they're out there. We need help. We need help. We need the power of the Lord God Most High. We can't face these things on our own. Prayer should be the first thing we do when we're confronted with something bad. Usually it's the last thing we do. So just sit for a moment. Let's let the Holy Spirit speak to us. If we have any kind of things, lions in our life, any kind of things that we need help with, prayer for. I'll be shocked if there aren't a bunch of us that need help. And if you don't know Jesus, this is the time to say yes. Don't pay attention to me when I said all hell's going to break loose against you. If you don't know Jesus, today's your day. Many things in our world are facing us. I wouldn't want to face them without the Lord. Would you? So let's not let this day get away from us if we've not said yes to Jesus. All salvation is, is trusting Jesus for your salvation and repenting of your sins. I'm going to pray a simple prayer. The music team is going to come back up. And as they're playing, if you feel the Lord's shown you anything that you need prayer for, please come up here and let us pray for you. Or even grab another brother or sister in the congregation and have them pray for you. It doesn't have to be big and dramatic. Let's pray. Father, we love you so much. We're so thankful that you are our God. Send your spirit to move through this place right now and tell us of things we need to do. If we need prayer for something, Lord. But I'm going to ask you to strengthen each one of us anyway. Whether we come forward or not. But please, Lord, compel people to come get prayer. And Lord, I know there are probably a few people here that don't know you. Compel them to come and to meet you. We just love you so much, Lord Jesus. You are our God, our King, our Lord. Bless these, your kids, now. Lord, bless us as we go our separate way. And I just thank you that we have the great privilege, honor to serve you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So if anybody needs anything, please come up. There will be a few people up here to pray for you. And then go and have a great day. And as my friend Todd says, serve your king.